Authorship. Citation. Paraphrasing. Original sources. Originality. Imitation. Plagiarism. 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 It can all get a bit confusing, can't it? The whole idea of using original sources to write our papers. We are told to read and use original sources, but beware if we don't do it correctly. If we don't employ proper academic citation, we will be branded as plagiarists and sentenced to a life of imprisonment on some distant, lonely island of shame. Where did the idea of academic citation and the ominous threat of plagiarism come from? How do we create those confusing, complex, in-text citations in APA? Maybe the topic of authorship, originality, and plagiarism is not excitingly stupendous or utterly fascinating, but it really can be interesting. And I know two college students who can show us just how interesting it can be. Meet John and Mary, brother and sister. John is a junior at ODU, majoring in psychology, with an emphasis in human factors. Mary is a first-year grad student in special education. A long time ago, in ancient Greece, Plato held that truth could not be owned by any one individual, because truth exists outside of an individual writer. St. Augustine, the Catholic bishop and philosopher who lived in the 5th century, agreed. He even said that a preacher who is not eloquent is permitted to deliver sermons written by others because the truth is more important than the preacher. Writers frequently borrowed from ancient religious texts when writing new texts because writing was meant to imitate reality, not create a new reality. It was even considered honorable to imitate original sources and intermix them with one's own writing. Uh, so you're saying that the Greeks and Romans, even the early Christians, thought that the truth in writing was more important than who wrote it? Exactly. How long did people think that way, that writing was meant to reflect the truth, and that it was okay to imitate the original writers? For quite a while. Thousands of years, really. Let's take a look at the medieval period in Europe, where people also thought the same way. There was a great reverence for authority, like religious leaders and ancient texts. Writers tended to follow the standards of the Catholic Church. Well, if they thought that the Church told the truth, and writing was to reflect the truth, then following what the Church taught makes sense. Yes, I agree. It makes a lot of sense. Like the apprentice trying to imitate the Master, doing and saying what the Master does and says. Along those lines, writers thought that old writing was better and more trustworthy than modern writing. That it was better to imitate and agree with established authorities than to express one's individual thoughts. So, imitation was good. Imitation, transformation, and adaptation of sources was a good thing. Like bees do a good thing when they transform pollen into honey, or the body transforms food into energy. So, writers were like the bees, taking the writings of others, like pollen, and creating new writings, like honey. You can't make new writings without using original sources, just like bees can't make honey without using the pollen of flowers. Yes, and it is a good thing. So, when did that change? The printing press. The printing press? You mean like the Gutenberg Bible during the Renaissance? That's what I mean. I read a fascinating book about the printing press and how it impacted writers after it was invented in Europe. Wait a minute. Didn't the Chinese first invent the printing press? Movable type, yes, in the 11th century. But they didn't have the internet or text messaging to send the message from China to Germany to show off their technology. So Europeans had to wait 300 years for their own technology to catch up when the Gutenberg Bible was printed. Anyway, once it was fairly easy to make books quickly and cheaply, writers began to see books as a way to make money, to make a living. Even make writing as a career. Writers first began to think of their work as a trade, like being a blacksmith or brewmeister. So writers wanted to protect their identity and incomes. Did people begin to look for specific writers that they liked? Yes, for the first time, we see novels becoming popular and people began to seek out their favorite writers, like brand names. Much the same as people specifically look for books written by Tom Clancy, G.K. Chesterton, or Jane Austen. Okay, how about Alexander Dumas? Three Musketeers and The Count of Monte Cristo were fantastic books. Exactly. Writers' names became brands that made money. When money is involved, people want to protect it, and others want to steal it. So publishers and writers wanted rules made to protect their money. Property that can be protected. Intellectual property. Is that when the word plagiarism was created? Kind of. The term plagiary came into English during this time, but it's not a new word. It's a Latin word for someone who kidnaps a child or a slave. <laughs> In the Renaissance, the term plagiarist came to describe someone who stole someone else's writing. 
So we see the first laws against borrowing from original works during the Renaissance? No, not quite. But the foundation was laid for sure. We first see the laws during the modern period that started in the 17th century after the Renaissance. During the modern period, which included the Industrial Revolution up to World War II, the English philosopher John Locke taught that man is entitled to the ownership of that which he creates, which was then extended to include works of the mind called rational powers. We saw an emphasis on the new and original, on the individual writer rather than religious authorities and ancient texts. Here is when the first copyright laws were passed in Europe, the Statute of Anne in 1710. So borrowing from or imitating original sources was now stealing? Yes, because of the printing press, plagiarism meant stealing the words of the original writer and the potential loss of money to the original writer. So copyright laws were passed to protect the original writer's income. Okay, how did the universities feel about plagiarism, as professors really don't make much money from writing textbooks? You must remember that the novel became quite popular in the modern period, like it still is today. But novels were mainly read by the poor and uneducated, who had only recently begun to read. Novels were not normally read by the wealthy and educated, at least not openly. The wealthy and educated read real literature. While novels were rip-offs, novels borrowed from and imitated literature. So any type of borrowing or imitation, that is, plagiarism, was considered cheap, dirty, inferior, and shameful. In the universities, such imitation, plagiarism, became punishable as an act of academic crime. Was plagiarism considered to be immoral, too? Yes. Plagiarism was viewed as dishonest behavior and a violation of moral laws. But what about the Internet, where all sorts of knowledge are there for everyone and put out there for other people to learn from and use, you know, for free? You know, like Wikipedia, Wikimedia Commons, Khan Academy, and Creative Commons that encourage the sharing and use of information for the betterment of the planet. Are people changing their minds about who owns words and ideas? Yes, people are. And that brings us to the period in which we live right now, the postmodern period. Today, there is a movement to rethink writing as a collaborative act rather than as a solitary one. A writer does not create the text. The text creates the writer. And meanings are circulated and shared. So you're saying that there is no one single writer, but rather there is a mixture of writers and shared meanings. Exactly. Ideas and words can't be owned by one individual. And now, digital technologies allow the communal creation of writings by many people, such as Wikipedia and works published under Creative Commons, as you mentioned. Wouldn't all the information on the internet be, like, public and free, like, not really owned by anyone, as it's owned by everyone? No. None of the information on the internet, not even on Wikipedia, is orphaned information. It all still has writers who are to be mentioned. If we just look at Creative Commons licensing, at its most free and communal level, you still have to give credit to the writers. You can use their work without asking permission, which is how Creative Commons is different from copyright, but you must at least cite the source. So I still have to cite Wikipedia? If your professors let you use Wikipedia, then yes. So how would a postmodern professor view accidental plagiarism? Accidental plagiarism often happens when you're trying to sound like the masters within the academic community. The same type of imitation practiced by apprentices during the medieval period, and therefore one important step towards becoming a master yourself, using the right phrases, the right words, in the right way. That's all part of the process of learning, a postmodern professor would likely say. Someone told me last semester that you only need to mention sources inside your paper if you directly quote them, that you don't have to if you just paraphrase ideas. Whoever told you that was wrong. You need to cite all of your sources within your text, quoted and paraphrased, all of them. You have your bibliography or reference page, which is the last part of your paper, but you still need to tell your readers exactly what came from where within your paper. That is called in-text citation. You do this for direct quotations and for paraphrases. Anytime you use a sentence, phrase, even just an idea, you need to tell the readers where that came from. So how... Let's say you want to paraphrase an original source, like a long passage. First, you want to use a signal word, a word that introduces the original source, a sign telling your readers that you're about to share the wisdom from someone else. Like a signpost along the highway telling us what's coming up, you add the signal word to the author's last name. Words like notes, such as, as Hoban notes regarding audience reaction to educational films, or asserts like, 
Bezito Moore asserts that the length of videos impacts, declares, or describes. So, signal words tell my readers that I'm about to introduce someone else's thoughts. Okay, but I don't get one thing. If I mention the writer within my paper, my readers can just go back to my bibliography and see the whole citation for Wittrock or Matheson. But what if I use two articles written by Wittrock? How will my readers know which one the paraphrase came from? Well, mentioning the writer is not enough, but it is the place to start. We also need to tell the reader the year the article or book was published. Here's how we do it. Take the writer's name and a signal word, and in between them, you put the year. Wittrock, 1990, states that the brain actively constructs meaning from the instruction given to it. But you have to put the year in parentheses, so it kind of stands out from the sentence. But I've also seen articles that don't use signal words. They just state the original writer's name and year. Yes, you can do that too. No signal word. First, you remove the signal phrase, claims that. Then move the writer's name to the end of the paraphrase, like this. Next, move the year so that it's behind the writer's name. Then you move the opening parentheses so that it's in front of the writer's name, and add a comma between his name and the year. And then capitalize the first word to move the period, right? Exactly. You will also see this technique used when several writers said basically the same thing. Let's say that Smith wrote about the same thing in 2003 as Jones in 2010. Wait a minute. How do I separate the citations? Do I put a comma in between them or periods or anything? I was getting there. Semicolons. You help your readers understand who gets what date by using semicolons between your citations. Oh, like we do when making a list. Okay, I bet you then that I move the ending parenthesis so that it's behind the last year, 2010. Yes. And put a period after that. And just clean this up a bit so the semicolon after 1992 is closer to the year. How does that look, sis? Perfect. Well, that's great for paraphrasing, but what if I need to quote an original source? I'm not even sure when I should paraphrase rather than use quotations. Paraphrases are great for summarizing a whole article or several original works, like we just did with the three different sources. My professors have told me that it's always best to paraphrase if possible. That way, I can show that I understand what I'm reading. But I agree, there are times when we need to quote, like when an original source is unique, uses vivid or powerful language, or is a famous saying. Paraphrasing won't cut it. Then we should quote the passage. Okay, so what if I wanted to quote that Wittrock article, the one from 1990? The essence of the generative learning model is that the mind or the brain is not a passive consumer of information. Okay, just like with the paraphrase, you need to use the author's last name, year of publication, and a signal word or phrase. Two things are added for a quotation. The first thing we add are quotation marks. Hey, what happened to the capital T and the word the? I changed it. You are allowed to change the capitalization of the original source to make it fit into your sentence. Okay, that's pretty cool. The second thing we add is the page number so your readers can find the quote if they want to. Put it outside of the quotation marks with a P and a period plus a space in parentheses. And the period with a quote stays within the quote. No, you put the period after it all. You left an extra space before the closing quotation mark. Leave it there or remove it. Yes, let's clean that up. Remove it. Much better. And there's a space between the closing quotation mark and the parentheses, right? Yes. What if the quote started on page 348 but finished on page 349? Do I just sneak in and 349? No, P is for just one page. Hmm, how about PS? No again. You use PP and the numbers are separated by a hyphen. Okay, hyphen between the page numbers, but no spaces. Got it. But what if there's no page number, like if I wanted to quote a website? Then you substitute the P with para, indicating the paragraph number. So, if it was paragraph 4, I would write para 4. Okay, got it. I think I understand how to cite paraphrases and quotes now, so that my readers can find the ideas and quotes in my sources. 